welcome. Um, for the movie, this is Thursday, October 24th. Um, this is the last lecture before our lecture exam, too. So this is the Tuesday-Thursday section. So the Tuesday-Thursday lecture exam is next Tuesday. And folks, remember the topics for lecture exam two will be metabolism, microbial growth, and microbial genetics through mutation. So we're going to hopefully finish microbial genetics today, but the information we talk about today will go on lecture exam three. Okay, so let me just walk down our announcements um, here. So folks, we'll have an open lab tomorrow, Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., and it's for both lab and lecture questions. Um, one of your colleagues asked if we could um, maybe do some practice quiz questions in open lab, and I can only do that if I record it and make it available to everybody. So everybody, everybody so far said, yeah, that would be fine. So if I do any practice, um, like lecture exam, two quiz questions in open lab tomorrow, I'll make a movie of it and post it on Canvas and, and announce it so everybody will have access. Let's see here. Um, so folks, again, we're going to be finishing microbial genetics today. Um, but I have three handouts. Two of them are for the next um, unit that we're going to do, Unit 7, Viruses and Prions. And some folks like to you know, stay ahead. So that's why I wanted to pass them out to you. Obviously, you guys, we're not going to start the next unit until next Thursday, right, after the lecture exam. But at least you'll have these to take a look at. The first one, folks, is the, um, and I apologize, I did change the title here. It should be Unit 7, Viruses and Prion Study Guide, Part A. So we'll pass that one out. And then the green one, folks, is um, the Unit 7, Viruses, uh, supplemental notes part A, so just hoping to help you with some, some of the key lecture points. And then, folks, the third one, um, these are some microbial genetics bonus topics. They're, they're really cool, they're important, we just run out of time. But these would both be bonus topics, bonus questions on lecture exam three. So it's talking about CRISPR, which is really cool. It's like an immune system of bacterial viruses that they now use to do amazing editing. And then um, the second topic is on PCR polymerase chain reaction, this cool way to amplify target sequences of DNA. And then the last topic is on DNA fingerprinting. So again, folks, I know a lot of you are feeling overwhelmed. Any kind of bonus topics, just ignore them, right? Um, but for those of you, maybe you've been hearing a lot about CRISPR in the news, right? Um, this is just a little, just kind of superficial introduction to those three topics. And again, they just be bonus questions on lecture exam three, not lecture exam two. All right. Now let's see if I can get our screen working. We're going to hope I can get our PowerPoint slides working. We're hoping. Are you listening? We're hoping that you're going to work, right? Okay, let's see. You're here on. Yes, there we are. Good. Okay, folks, so we're going to start then with, um, with the very last part of our microbial genetics part two. And, folks, this is the start of lecture exam three information, so you might want to put in like a big big line there, a big announcement, right? So you don't panic this week and thinking you have to know this stuff for lecture exam two. Okay, so folks, what we're going to talk about is this cool process that bacteria can carry out called horizontal gene transfer. Some people call it lateral gene transfer. And this is a pretty amazing thing. It's something we humans can't do, right? So this is when bacteria living in a community, in a population, they can actually share genes with one another, right? So we're only used to being able to share genes, like passing them on to our, our kids, right? So um, bacteria, in addition to replicating by binary fission, copying their DNA and splitting in two, they can also share DNA with their neighbors. They might not even be related. So this is kind of amazing. The reason we're so interested in horizontal gene transfer from kind of a... Um, uh, medical point of view is this is a great way for bacteria to share their antibiotic resistance genes. This helps us understand why, say, in hospitals where a lot of antibiotics are used, that the bacteria can quickly acquire uh, resistance against multiple antibiotics. 
from an evolutionary biologist's point of view, horizontal gene transfer is really important because it helps bacteria generate genetic diversity in their populations. And we know, you guys, that without genetic diversity, you know, organisms aren't going to make it. We need to have that genetic diversity. So since bacteria replicate asexually, meaning copy their chromosome, split in two, we would say that there's not a lot of genetic diversity amongst bacteria. So they've evolved these horizontal gene transfers as a way of increasing genetic diversity, and that's going to increase their survival in an ever-changing environment. Okay, so you guys, um, let me first start out with a real simple cartoon of horizontal gene transfer because there's a, a little problem that the bacteria face during horizontal gene transfer that we need to describe first before we can look at the three different ways that this happens. Okay, so you guys, let me erase this for right now. So in horizontal gene transfer, we, maybe we can think of it almost like a, um, an organ transplant or a blood transfusion. Because we always talk about two bacteria that have two different roles. So in horizontal gene transfer, we're going to have a donor bacterium. And we'll just put the donor bacterium chromosomal DNA in red. So this is the chromosome. Oops. Right? And then this line, you guys, represents three different ways that the donor bacterium can transfer some DNA. To a recipient bacterium. So this will be our recipient bacterium, just like you'd have a blood donor and a blood recipient. And for contrast, we'll put the recipient's chromosomal DNA in blue. So this is the recipient's chromosome. And again, guys, just kind of in the big, big picture, kind of big, big concept, what will happen is the donor will donate some, a piece of donor DNA to the recipient. And we'll talk about how this will be done. But for right now, you guys, let's just pretend somehow that donor DNA is going to get inside the recipient, right? Now, the problem is, is see how this is a linear piece of DNA? Linear DNA is recognized as bacteria as possible viral DNA. So they evolve enzymes to destroy it, to hydrolyze it. So for that donor DNA to survive within the recipient, it has to get itself inserted into the recipient's chromosome. And folks, this is, it's an amazing process. It would, it, it would deserve you know, several lectures of its own. We're going to simplify it so much by simply um, calling it homologous recombination. So this process in which the donor DNA is inserted into the recipient's chromosome, we're going to describe this as homologous recombination. So homologous means something similar. So this donor DNA has to align itself with a DNA sequence on the recipient's chromosome that has a, a similar DNA sequence. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, but it has to be somewhat similar. Homologous, right? And then in this cool process, you guys, that we're just going to cartoon <coughs> as two X's at the end of the donor DNA, these two X's, the donor DNA is going to replace the homologous sequence of recipient DNA. And again, I know you guys, this is unfair because I get to erase, but the end result is the donor DNA is going to replace that sequence of recipient DNA. So I know you guys, this is unfair. I get to erase. So the end result of this homologous recombination, recombination, we're combining DNA from two different organisms, combining DNA from the donor and the recipient. The result is 
the donor DNA is going to replace that, that piece of recipient DNA. The recipient DNA, you guys, is going to end up getting released into the cytoplasm. And what's going to happen to that linear recipient DNA, you guys? What's going to happen to it? What happens to linear DNA in bacteria? Gets chopped up, right? Right? So then, folks, this recipient bacterium, when it acquires that donor DNA and gets it inserted into its um, chromosome, this recipient bacterium would then be called a recombinant, right? Because it's carrying genetic information from two different organisms, okay? Now, if the donor bacterium transfers a circular plasma to the recipient, it's not a problem because bacteria don't destroy circular DNA. Why not? Their chromosomes are circular, right? And they too have circular plasmids, so there aren't enzymes that will destroy circular DNA. It's just linear pieces of DNA that have to go through this special process of homologous recombination. Okay? All right, so in our PowerPoint slides, there's a fancier description showing you some of the step-by-step um, of homologous recombination. We're not going to go into those step-by-steps. We just need to know that there's going to be proteins and enzymes that will be responsible for the homologous recombination, inserting the donor DNA into a similar homologous sequence, um, replacing the recipient's DNA at that homologous sequence. And this is just a little cartoon, you guys. It's a little bit better. So this would be our recipient our recipient bacterium folks with the light purple chromosome. This is our donor DNA and dark purple, right? Donor DNA is inside. It's going to be destroyed unless it can somehow get itself inserted into the recipient's chromosome. So this process by which the donor uh, DNA will replace part of the recipient's chromosomal DNA is called homologous recombination. And again, you guys, we're always asking, well, what's, why? You know, why are all this trouble? So remember, this is a way that bacteria can increase their genetic diversity, right? And again, you know, I guess I'm like beating the drum here. It's like we need genetic diversity for populations of organisms to survive. Okay, good. All right, you then. So folks, um, now see how I, I had that magical line saying donor DNA is transferred to the recipient? Well, there's three different ways bacteria can do that, the three different ways of horizontal gene transfer, and that's what we're going to take a look at right now. So let me list those three different ways. The first one is called transformation. The second way is called conjugation. And the third way is called transduction. So these are just three different ways the donor DNA can get into the recipient, and we, we're going to explore those. So folks, the first um, example of horizontal gene transfer we're going to take a look at is called transformation. Um, it, was, it was first discovered by Frederick Griffith um, in the early 1900s. And, and you guys, there's some really powerful history that goes behind this. So let me, you guys, let me, um, let me use my little cartoon here. Um, for the basis of our discussion of transformation. So again, you guys, this was discovered by a British scientist by the name of Frederick Griffith. And Frederick Griffith, um, he had survived the horrible 1918-1919 horrible influenza pandemic. And a pandemic, folks, <clears throat> is a worldwide epidemic, right? And in, it just, I mean, oh, it's just horrible time, you guys, because World War I was 1914 to 1918. So this horrible pandemic started just in the, the final year of World War I. So there was all that trauma. And then it, it continued into 1919. And, and the powerful result was more people were killed in the influenza pandemic than probably have been killed in all of our world wars. And, and what made it so even worse was that nobody knew what caused it. Influenza, at one time people thought it was the influence of the planets or the moon, right? Nobody knew um, um, how it was caused. And, and including during, during the actual pandemic, they still didn't know what was causing it. So you guys, do you know what causes it now? 
which which class of microbe causes influenza? It's a virus, right? So back in the day, nobody knew what what caused it, and of course that made it worse. And then furthermore, you guys, um, what makes <clears throat> influenza even a day really bad is that if you survive the influenza infection, so influenza survivors were often at higher risk for a second infection, so we call it for uh, secondary bacterial pneumonia. And the reason for this is that the um, influenza virus, it invades the cells of that per respiratory tract and replicates in them and destroys those, and I, I don't think we've talked about this yet, you guys, but in humans in the upper respiratory tract and the trachea, our um, epithelial cells have these beautiful cilia that beat together. And those cilia, what they're trying to do is move this sticky mucus blanket that lies on top of our um, mucous membranes. They're trying to move this sticky mucus blanket up to the back of our throat. Now, one purpose of the sticky mucus blanket is it's like microbial flypaper, right? So as we're inhaling garbage and microbes, hopefully it's going to get stuck in that mucus blanket and then the cilia beat to move it to the back of our throat. Where What could we do if it gets to the back of our throat? We could spit it out, right? Or we could swallow it, in which case the uh, microbes would be destroyed in the stomach acid. Or if we spit them out, we're physically removing them, right? Well, the problem is if you have influenza and the viruses are replicating in those epithelial cells, often your, those cilia don't work anymore. So if you inhale microbes, for example, the bacterial pathogen Streptococcus pneumonia, the Streptococcus pneumonia might get stuck in that mucus blanket, but because the cilia aren't working, the mucus blanket just, just sits there, right? And so the strep pneumonia can start replicating, growing and replicating, and moving down to the lower respiratory tract, where they can cause bacterial pneumonia. And this can be life-threatening. Right? This can be life-threatening. And you guys, back in the early 1900s, um, did they have antibiotics to treat bacterial pneumonia? No. Right? So often, if you survive influenza, you might end up dying of secondary bacterial pneumonia, right? Because there's no antibiotics. Well, Griffith, who had survived this horrible period in history, Again, he didn't know what caused influenza, right? So they couldn't come up with a vaccine because they didn't know what was causing it. But you guys, they did know, they did know that streptococcus pneumonia could cause the secondary bacterial pneumonia that could kill some of the influenza survivors. So Griffith was trying to make a streptococcus pneumonia vaccine, right? A vaccine that we purposely inoculate our patients with so that it would trigger an immune response. So that, so that if they ever got infected with the virulent streptococcus pneumonia, they'd have a quick, fast immune response, and then they wouldn't end up dying, right, from the strep pneumonia. So that was Griffith's goal. So what Griffith did in, in trying to develop this vaccine, so his, his goal was to develop a strep pneumonia vaccine. to protect people from dying from streptococcus pneumonia pneumonia. He had two strains of streptococcus pneumonia. One strain was called the S strain for smooth colony type, because when you grew them on auger, they made these beautiful, smooth, glistening colonies. And the reason was, they, the S strain makes this nice, thick polysaccharide capsule. Okay, so the S strain makes a thick polysaccharide capsule. And folks, remember, um, capsules, if you're a bacterium invading a human, a capsule is a great um, survival strategy because human phagocytic cells can't bind to bacterial capsules, right? So we say the capsule is antiphagocytic. It protects the bacterium from being killed by host phagocytes, right? And that means you could spread from the lungs into the blood, spread even to the central nervous system, right? 
So um, because the, the estrogen have this thick, thick polysaccharide capsule, and we, could, we can pretend like this, you guys. So um, streptococcus, members of the genus streptococcus, they're gram-positive cocci, and in streptococcus pneumonia, when the cells divide in two, often pairs remain attached. So we would describe them as diplococci, so gram-positive diplococci. And folks, what I'll do is I'll put a, a thick polysaccharide capsule around them. So this is the thick polysaccharide capsule. Okay, so the capsule is in red. And again, that prevents them from being destroyed by the human phagocytes. So because of this um, polysaccharide capsule, it means the S strain is very virulent. So it has high virulence. Virulence is a measure of how much damage a pathogen can do. And the ultimate damage is killing, right? That's the ultimate damage. And, and so luckily Griffith was not using human subjects. He was using um, mice. And so when he would inoculate the S strain into his little mice, what would happen? It kills the mice. Okay, so we need to realize that, that the S strain is highly virulent. It can kill the test animals. The guinea pigs, although they weren't guinea pigs, they were mice, right? Okay. Now, in contrast, you guys, the second strain that Griffith was using was called the R strain. So the second type of bacterium that Griffith was using in his vaccines was called the R strain. For a rough colony type, why do you think the R strain made rough appearing colonies? What do you think they lacked that the S strain had? They lacked they lacked capsules, right? So these little guys, they were they lacked capsules, and the reason was, folks, was that they had a mutation in the genes for the capsule or enzyme. So the capsule was made by enzymes. And so from some mistake during DNA replication, remember DNA has that low mutation rate. There was a mistake made in copying the, um, the DNA for the enzymes that make the capsule, right? And so we end up with an enzyme that couldn't work. And that's why the little R strain, they lack the capsule. They're, they're mutants, right? So here's our little R strain, and remember, you guys, there's no capsule. So do you think if, if um, these little guys lacked a capsule, do you think it would be easy for host phagocytes to attach to them and ingest them and kill them? Yeah, and, and the reason is that peptoglycan, phagocytes have receptors for, for peptoglycan, so they can ingest them, right? So these little guys are easily killed. They're easily killed by host phagocytes. So, so you guys, do you think they're going to be highly virulent or almost avirulent, meaning cause no damage? Avirulent, right? Because the host phagocytes just gobble them up, you know, a nice little lunch for them, right? So we would say these guys are avirulent. They don't cause damage. And folks, if we inject them into mice, will the mice live? Yeah, because the, mi the, the mouse phagocytes can destroy them, right? So if we inject mice, the mice live, right? Because their phagocytes destroy them. Okay, so this is the, these are the actors in the drama, including our little mice. So what Griffith did in trying to come up with an experiment to develop a vaccine, he, he ran four different experiments in his little mice, okay? And so you guys, just so we have the um, cartoon correct here. So this is, this is the artist's cartoon for the S strain. So we see here the, the two little um, diplococci, and here they're using orange for the capsule, okay? So in the first experiment, Griffith inoculated the mice with living S strain, and what happened to the little mice? They died, right? And then Griffith necropsied the little mice and took samples and inoculated auger plates. What kind of colonies grew? Smooth, glistening S strain colonies, right? Okay, makes sense. The second experiment, Griffith took living R strain, inoculated the little mice, and what happened? Happy mice, right? They live. Now, and actually, guys, I, like if I was the artist, um, in showing 
uh, the results of cultures of the, the living mice blood and tissues, I would have put no colonies at all, right? Because trying to emphasize that the R strain was easily killed by the mouse phagocytes, right? Well, so far, so good. And in the, the third experiment, you guys, this is a classic way to make a low tech, tech vaccine. You take your pathogen and you kill it. And an easy way to kill them is just to heat them. Heat them enough so that they die, but not so much that all their proteins are going to be nature. We're going to see the proteins are what trigger, help to trigger the immune response, right? So Griffith took the S strain and killed it by heating them and injected the mice with the dead S strain. And what do you think happened? <coughs> the mice lived. Makes sense, right? The pathogen's dead, right? That makes sense. Um, and when he sampled tissues and blood, nothing grew. Makes sense, right? But you guys, what was wild was the fourth experiment. So what Griffith did is he took living R strain that didn't kill the mice, and he mixed them with dead S strain that didn't kill the mice. So he inoculated the mice with a combination of living R and dead S. And what would you predict should happen? I, I would have predicted that the mice should live, right? But what happened? The mice died, and when he necropsied them and took um, samples of tissues and inoculated the tissues onto auger plates, what kind of colonies grew? Smooth glistening. And he's like, what the heck? I, I don't think the Brits say what the heck, but we can pretend. Like, what's going on here, right? And so he did the right thing. He said, well, maybe I didn't kill all the S strain, right? Let me, let me repeat it. Let, let me make absolutely sure that all the S strain were dead. And he repeated it made sure the best strain was dead, repeated the fourth experiment, and the same thing happened. And he was like, what's, what's happening here? What's happening here? Now, guys, a little bit of history, just to, to make his, um, his hypothesis even more kind of mind-blowing. Back in the day, back in the 1900s, you guys, people still didn't know what the genetic information of cells is. Can you imagine that? I mean, you guys probably learn about it in kindergarten. You know, you know the DNA is the genetic information of cells. But back in the early 1900s, I think this was around like 1920, scientists weren't sure yet. And there were actually two camps. There was a group of scientists that thought proteins was a genetic information of cells. And they said it makes sense. Proteins are so diverse, you know, like 20 or 21 amino acids for your alphabet. So proteins have to be the genetic information of cells. And then the, there was this other camp of weirdos who believed that DNA was a genetic information of cells. And the protein folks laughed at them and say, how can DNA encode all the information for a human, let alone a bacterium? You only have four letters in your alphabet. Are you guys nuts? So they would get together and yell at one another and gossip and say mean things about one another. And so, so we've got to remember this, you guys, when Frederick Griffith was coming up with his hypothesis. See, you see, you guys, how we have DNA here? Back then, they didn't know it was DNA, right? There's the genetic information. So if we go back to the day, we could put like X, right? Like the X factor. So Griffith came up with a hypothesis, and this was brilliant, you guys. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adjust my cartoon here a little bit, you guys. Let's pretend this donor, this donor in our um, experiment here, let's say this is our dead S donor. Now remember you guys, on our dead S donor, the, the dead S donor had um, genes for enzymes that could make what? Capsules. So you guys, let me put capsule gene here. Right? On our donor DNA. And that meant that these guys could make what? A capsule, right? So here's our capsule. And then you guys over here, okay, if this is our R strain, our R recipient, and you guys, I'm so sorry, I've been having trouble with my contact lenses, and I just have a boulder in my eye right now. So if I start crying, it's not because I'm so sad about the mice or anything like that. It's just I got a boulder. So this is going to be our living R strain. And folks, remember how we said that the R strain could make capsule because they had a mutant capsule genes for the, um, the enzymes that make the capsule were mutant. They had the wrong amino acid sequence, so this little guy couldn't make any capsule. Does that make sense? Okay. So what Griffith um, came up with 
is that he decided that somehow the dead S strain had released, and he, again, you guys, he didn't know his DNA, had released some transforming factor. And in this case, you guys, transforming means something that can change you. So he didn't say DNA, he didn't say protein. He said the dead S strain rele released some transforming factor that was taken up by the living R strain. And somehow that transforming factor transformed, changed R strain into a capsule producing bacterium. Does this, does this make sense so far, you guys? Hopefully, okay. And again, you guys, they didn't know it was DNA yet. But what was so powerful was it was soon discovered you could repeat this experiment and you didn't have to inoculate um, mice. You could do it in a test tube. And this meant then that experiments could be run to figure out what was that, that X factor. This X factor is a transforming factor. What they did was that they repeated this experiment in test tubes and to each test tube, they would add, say to one test tube, they would add a lipase. It would destroy lipids. So if, if lipids were the transforming factor, the, the experiment wouldn't work. And to another tube, they would add RNAs, enzymes that destroy RNA. So if RNA was a transforming factor, transformation would work. So they set up their test tubes. And in the test tube to which they added proteases, what are proteases? Enzymes that destroy proteins, right? So if proteins were the genetic information, the transforming factor, the transformation should not have worked in the tube that contained the protease, right? But it worked. It worked. But in the tube to which they added DNAs, what are DNAs? They destroy DNA, right? Do you think the transformation worked? It did not work. And so you guys, that was one of the, one of the early powerful experiments that um, supported the hypothesis that this transforming factor, this genetic information was what? It was DNA. And, and right now, you guys, I know you're like, well, uh, duh, of course. But back then, that was such a big deal. It was such a big deal to finally start narrowing it down. Yeah, it looks like the, the genetic information of at least bacteria is DNA. That was a big deal back then, right? Okay. So folks, now, now, now we know about DNA, and now we know about the molecular mechanism here. Now we can explain what was happening in Griffith's mouse experiment. So what happened, you guys, was when the, de the dead bacteria were mixed with the living R strains. What happens to dead bacteria? Do they break open? Yep, they do. They lice, right? So the dead S strain had broken open. And the chromosomal DNA had gotten broken up into pieces, got broken up into fragments. Okay, so we'll just, we'll show it getting broken up into fragments. And one of those fragments you guys carry what? The capsule gene, right? And here's the amazing thing that we now know. Some bacteria in nature, some bacteria in nature they make DNA binding proteins. And you guys, the, uh, the species Streptococcus pneumonia are one of these DNA binding protein making bacteria. Okay, so let's put this on the side. Okay, so the R strain made DNA binding proteins. And these proteins are in the cytoplasm or cell membrane. And their job is to do what? Yeah, they bind, they attach to naked DNA floating in the environment. It's absolutely crazy. So they bind to naked, meaning it's not contained in another cell, it's not contained in a virus, it's just they bind naked DNA and transfer into the cell. So you guys, so just, I mean, this is so crude. So it would have been, if this is cell wall, these DNA binding proteins, you guys, they'd be in the cell membrane here, right? So there's these DNA binding proteins. So when living R cells were mixed with the dead um, S strain, right? And the dead S strain chromosomal DNA was floating around in there in pieces. So this R strain, it bound which piece of donor DNA? The capsule, the, the piece of donor DNA that had the capsule genes, 
right? But what happens, you guys, once it got into the cell, right, it's linear, what's going to happen to it? Why did it survive? Homologous recombination, yeah, right? The homologous recombination. Because remember, you guys, the, um, the R strain, it had um, a mutant DNA sequence, but it's still the DNA sequence would have been pretty similar to the normal wild type capsule piece. Okay. So what happened, those capsule genes, those donor capsule genes, how did they get inserted into the recipient's chromosome, you guys? Yeah, homologous recombination. We do the little X's here. Yeah. And again, I apologize, guys, because I know I get to erase. So the end result was the R screen was transformed by incorporating the donor capsule genes into its chromosome. Now, what can the R, what can the transformed R screen make now? Capsule, right? So our transformant, our recombinant, our strain, now is making a capsule. So could we tell the difference, you guys? Looking at a colony, could we tell? Could we tell if this was the original S strain or this was the transformed R strain? We can't. They all look the same, right? But that is what Griffith recovered on his plate. These were the living R strain that had been transformed, changed by taking up the S-strain um, capsule uh, gene DNA and inserting it into the chromosome, right? Isn't that crazy? And, and to me, you guys, what was so crazy is that Griffith came up with this hypothesis that, that, um, that was correct. Even if he didn't even know the DNA was genetic information, but he still came up with this model that works. Okay, so you guys, was that a lot of information? <sighs> yes, it was a lot of information. Why do we care? Right, could, um, so folks, you see here how, how we took an avirulent microbe and through transformation, now we've turned it into a virulent microbe, right? So do you think this is going on out there in nature? Yeah. So we could have camp, capsule genes um, transferred. We could have toxin genes transferred, right? And we're really worried about antibiotic resistance genes. So this is another way, you guys, that um, antibiotic resistance genes can be transferred from a donor to a, a, a living recipient. Yeah, Crystal. Um, so just to clarify, because mm -hmm. it took time to understand how the gene transfer worked. But for the mice, why, I don't, thinking before having the knowledge, why would we think that putting the capsule and the non-capsule together would work? Because I would think the non-capsule one would be the one that would be um, killed easily. But then yeah, the yeah. the capsule ones would still be the, the remaining survivor. Yeah, but in this case, the thing, the thing that was kind of the pickle here was that the S strain, the encapsulated strain, were dead. And he repeated it to make sure they were dead. So if they were dead, how could they live? How could they live and kill the little mouse? And how, how could they live, kill the little mouse, and then be recovered here? So his hypothesis was the only thing that could be alive is who? Is the R strain. And so then he was like, well, one possibility is somehow the R strain was changed, transformed into a capsule making strain. So that that was his cool hypothesis. And so he's he's and then he's like, well, how could that happen? Well, if the dead S strain released genetic information, and remember, didn't know what it was, released the genetic information to make capsule, and somehow the R strain took up that genetic information. He called it the transforming. And that's what permitted the R strain to start making capsule. Does that make sense, you guys? I mean, it's just like, I mean, people, people, you know what it is, you guys? And this is what's so bad, I think, in science education. To be a good scientist, you have to have a good imagination. And I think in a lot of our science education, we beat the imagination out of you. You need to have a really good imagination to be a good scientist and to make these huge new discoveries, right? So don't let people destroy your imagination. It's like one, it's a really crucial thing from your childhood. You need to hold on to it. Yeah. Um, so could we go like then backwards and like transfer the mutant DNA from the R strain that was like not the capsule into the S strain? Um, if, if, if we had if we had like if we had um, 
If we had living S strain, they already have the capsule gene. But, but what about this, you guys? What about, what if the R strain had an antibiotic resistance gene? It could trans right. It could transfer an antibiotic resistance strain. If we did this in reverse, if we killed the R strain, mix it with living S strain, and then ask, could we get a capsule producing antibiotic resistant S strain? We could. And isn't that scary? Because now we have a highly virulent antibiotic resistant bacterium. Do you think that's going on out there in nature? Uh-huh. It is, yeah. So spot on, yeah. They're, they're promiscuous, you guys. We say bacteria reproduce asexually, but they're promiscuous. They love to share their DNA with strangers, even, mm -hmm. right? And again, you know, with regard to um, sharing antibiotic resistance, this is really bad news for us humans. Yeah. Okay, you guys, so we'll keep going, right? Okay, you guys, so we finished with transformation. And you guys, let me ask you, and transformation, is the donor dead or alive? Dead, right? Is the recipient alive or dead? Alive. Alive, good, okay. In this next type of horizontal gene transfer, you guys, <coughs> oh, excuse me, called conjugation, this is the only type of horizontal gene transfer where the donor is actually alive, right? Every, all the other ways we're going to kill the donor. <clears throat> but in this next example, the donor will be alive. And the donor bacterium is going to come into close physical contact with the recipient bacterium and then transfer a copy of DNA to the recipient. And again, folks, we're taking a, a, his, a historical approach to this. So we'll take a look at um, our kind of our genetic workhorse, good old E. coli to explore conjugation in bacteria. All right, so you guys, we first did transformation. Okay, so we'll put a check mark by that check. So next we're gonna do conjugation. This is a second way that bacteria can um, do horizontal gene transfer. And in conjugation, you guys, um, we have donor DNA is transferred by close physical contact between a living donor, and this is kind of new, a living donor and living recipient. So you guys, again, in transformation, was the donor dead or alive? Dead. Donor is dead. Donor is dead. Recipient is alive. Conjugation, both the donor and the recipient are alive. Okay. And folks, again, historically, um, I believe it was in E. coli. This was first discovered. And it's in E. coli and its relatives where this is really dramatic, right? Because in our gram negatives, uh, such as the Enterobacteriaceae. Um, in conjugation, we've got a donor, right? And the donor is going to form this beautiful protein of um, hollow structure called a sex pillus or F pillus or conjugation pillus to make physical contact with a, with a recipient. And then the donor can shorten the pillus and bring the recipient into really close physical contact. And it's at that point the donor is going to inject the recipient with a copy of the donor DNA, right? So this is really dramatic. In contrast, you guys, gram-positive bacteria can also carry out conjugation, but they usually don't make these beautiful, dramatic sex pill life, right? Theirs is, theirs is not as dramatic, but I just want you to know that gram-positive bacteria can also carry out conjugation, but we'll just use E. coli as our, our sample organism. Okay. So you guys, we're going to use, as our model, again, we're going to use good old E. coli. And to understand conjugation in E. coli, we have to talk about a special DNA sequence called the fertility factor. And again, in biology, we're bad. You know, we're always abbreviating things, so we could call it the F factor. And this is a, a special DNA sequence and this DNA sequence carries the genes 
for the sex pillus. And again, folks, you can call it sex pillus, an F pillus, a conjugation pillus. On short answer, any of these descriptions is fine. Again, folks, it's a hollow protein tube that's made out of little protein subunits. So the donor can assemble and disassemble. Um, assembling will make the F pillus longer. Disassembling will make it shorter. And furthermore, there's genes for DNA transfer. And, and, and indeed, you guys, it's so cool. Down at the base of the, of the sex pillus, it's like a protein hypodermic syringe and needle, right, through which the donor will inject the recipient with a copy of DNA. I mean, these are little tiny bacteria. This is so sophisticated, right? OK. And then, folks, the fertility factor, it can, um, the F factor, can form a plasmid, in which case it's called the F plasmid, or it can form, oh my, see, I didn't I did use that correctly, you guys. Let's see, F factor can. Let me, let me move form down here. Can form a plasmid, or the F factor, you guys, this is wild, can insert into the bacterial chromosome. And when it does this, the bacterium is called an HFR cell. And HFR stands for high frequency of recombination. So we're just laying the groundwork, you guys, and then we'll use cartoons so we understand why, why, you know, why we care about this high frequency of recombination. Okay. So what we want to do, you guys, is we want to look at two, two different types of matings. This is, we're really bad because as humans, we're always trying to relate things to ourselves, right? So some people call this, and, it's, and here it is, you guys, look at that sex pillows. This is not sex. Right? But as humans, we're like, well, it looks like sex, right? But anyway, so um, we, we refer to the, um, uh, these donor and recipients, um, the transfer DNA, we refer to them as matings. And again, that's really not appropriate. It's something in sexually reproducing animals, what we do. And sometimes we call it male and female. So just be careful, you guys, will, you'll hear about that. Um, I think it is really misleading for people to call this bacterial sex because we're not burning gametes, right? So just don't let people all right, so you guys, let's take a look at two so-called matings. And in a mating, we need a donor. And then we put an X, you guys, to show the donor is going to be passing DNA to a recipient. And then we want to look at the results, right? So the first mating, you guys, is going to be really easy. We're going to take a... Um, <clears throat> We're going to take uh, E. coli carrying the F plasmid, and these, these little guys are called F plus. Okay. So the first meeting, we're going to take an E. coli carrying the F plasmid, and we're going to, um, our recipient is always going to be F negative, you guys. So having the F factor makes you a donor. If you lack the F factor, you're always a recipient. So let's take a look at this cartoon. So folks, in this cartoon, Here's our F, our F plus donor. Here's the donor chromosome. Here's the F plasmid. So it, um, the F factor is in a plasmid. So officially, this is the plasmid. Here's our F negative recipient, right? And the donor has already made physical contact with the F pillus, has shortened the F pillus to draw the recipient close physical contact. And now that little protein hypodermic syringe and needle is going to inject the recipient with a copy of the F plasmid. And here you guys, we see the copy of the F plasmid being transferred to the recipient. And at the end of the mating, we end up with, what do we have now? Two donors, right? Isn't that awesome? OK, so we're going to end up with two F plus donors, right? Now, you guys are probably like, well, what does that accomplish, right? It's like, you know, what? So it's the next meeting, you guys, that, that, that helps us understand why conjugation is so powerful. So in this next meeting, you guys, our donor is going to be one of those E. coli that, in which the F factor is inserted into the E. coli chromosome. So let's take a look at that cartoon. So you guys, this is showing us formation of an HFR donor. 
So we're going to start out with a, um, an F plus donor, an F plus meaning it's got the plasmid. And these little lines you guys are showing where the F plasmid is going to insert itself into the donor's chromosome, there. And we end up now with a donor called an HFR donor that has the F factor inserted into the chromosome. And this is going to change things. It's pretty cool. So you guys, so now let's have our donors in HFR. What's our recipient? Our recipient is always F negative, right? And now we're going to see the result. And this is really cool. So you guys, here's our HFR donor and our F negative recipient. So what happens is during conjugation, the donor is going to transfer a copy of the F factor and a copy of its chromosome to the recipient. How wild is that? But you guys, the transfer is really interesting. The transfer starts out about midway in the F factor. Right? So initially, half, half the F factor, a copy of the F factor, is going to be transferred to the recipient. And then slowly, a copy of the donor's chromosome will be transferred. And then finally, after about an hour and a half or two hours, the second half, the second, um, the, the copy of the second half of the, F, of the F factor will be transferred to the recipient. But you guys, imagine this is going on in your intestinal tract. You have two E. coli in there, an HFR, um, carry out conjugation with a ne negative cell. Do you think they're going to remain attached to one another for an hour and a half? No way, you know, all that food and fluid and feces move around in there. So in nature, this conjugation bridge is usually broken before the full transfer occurs. The recipient will get half the F factor, but rarely does the recipient get the other half of the F factor. Do you become F plus if you only have half an F factor? No, you don't, okay? So in nature, you guys, Usually what happens is the conjugation bridge is broken before you have complete transfer of both pieces of the F factor. So use, usually your recipient remains a recipient, F negative. But what has been accomplished? What has been transferred? Part of the donor chromosome, or a copy of part of the donor chromosome has been transferred. And what can happen, you guys? What can happen to that copy of the donor chromosome? If it gets transferred, could it get inserted into the recipient's chromosome through homologous recombination? Yes, it yes it can. Who cares? Why is that helpful? Could could this offer some genetic diversity to the recipient? Right? Yeah, yeah. It could be that the donor has different gene variants, right? So you guys, the as biologists, we think this whole conjugation evolved and has survived because again, it's increasing genetic diversity among bacteria. And why is genetic diversity good? It's going to help. It's going to help that population survive, right? Because the environment's always changing. Yeah. So, you guys, so we would argue then, over here, HFR donors uh, conjugated with an F negative recipient. You'll, you'll have your HFR donor, you'll have your F negative recipient, still a recipient, but what has the recipient acquired? This little guy is a is a recombinant, right? The don't excuse me, you guys. The recipient has acquired. Recipient has acquired um, new genetic information. And you guys might it be like antibiotic resistance or toxin production, right? Any of the same from the donor. So again, you guys, in nature, anything that increases genetic diversity is biologists, we believe there'll be natural selection for that mechanism that increases genetic diversity. Yeah? Okay. So far, so good, you guys. We're almost finished with horizontal gene transfer. So you guys, the, the last one we're going to do, and this is really cool, and we're going to do it very superficially, because to understand this last example of horizontal gene transfer called transduction, we really have to study... Um, bacterial virus replication. And we aren't going to do that until the next unit. So we're going to do this really superficially. But it will be a good appetizer um, for the, um, the virus unit that we're going to start after lecture exam two. So you guys, this last example of horizontal gene transfer is called transduction. And in transduction, 
donor DNA from a bacteria will be transferred to a recipient by a bacterial virus. And bacterial viruses these days are often called bacteriophages, bacteria eaters. So sometimes people will just say phage. And a phage, you're supposed to know that a phage is a bacterial virus. So you guys, the, the um, third example of horizontal gene transfer then is going to be called transduction. So transduction is transfer of donor bacterial DNA to a recipient bacterium by a bacterial virus. And you guys, another name for a bacterial virus is bacteriophage. Phage means to eat. And this is because, because, because historically, people thought bacteriophages were eating bacteria because they caused them to die. So bacteria eaters, you could say. OK. And again, folks, this will be pretty superficial. Um, we'll get into a lot more detail in Unit 7. But in transduction, folks, we're going to start with our donor bacterium, dark purple chromosomal DNA. And the donor is getting infected by a bacterial virus. Now, we'll see the bacterial viruses. They have an outer protein coat. And inside, in this particular case, the bacterial virus has um, DNA. So the virus attaches to the outside of the bacterium and injects the bacterium with, with the virus DNA. And once the virus DNA gets into the bacterium, it's really sad. The bacterial RNA polymerase transcribes it into viral mRNA in the bacterial ribosomes. Um, well, I think I said that wrong in case. When the phage DNA, the viral DNA, gets inside the bacterium, the bacterial RNA polymerase transcribes the uh, viral DNA into viral mRNA, and then the bacterial ribosomes translate the viral mRNA into viral proteins. And this, the poor little bacterium, this is the end for it. Because the phage enzymes take over, take over the little bacterium, turning it into a virus factory. It no longer can take care of itself. The bacterium can't take care of itself. All it's doing is making viral proteins and viral DNA. As part of that process, viral enzymes um, um, fragment the chromosome because the bacterial chromosome will act as nucleotides to make more copies of Bosch DNA, right? And it's a wild process, you guys. So after the little bacterium has made all the Bosch proteins, the proteins self-assemble into new little Bosch particles here. And the Bosch DNA just automatically gets packaged inside these little phage particles, right? The phage will uh, release a lysozyme-like substance, and that causes the bacterium to lyse, releasing all the newly replicated phage. And they're, they're going to go and bind to a neighboring bacterium and start this all over again, right? We're like, well, what does this have to do with horizontal gene transfer? You guys, let's back up here. See how the, the viruses are causing the bacterial chromosomal DNA to be broken into fragments? So sometimes when the new viruses are being assembled, there's little pieces of donor DNA floating around in the cytoplasm. And by accident, sometimes donor DNA gets packaged into those little viral particles. And what's so cool, you guys, is those little viral particles carrying the donor bacterial DNA, they're still infectious. They can still bind to a neighboring bacterium, the recipient, and inject the neighboring bacterium with the donor bacterial DNA. Now, what will happen, you guys, for that donor DNA to survive in the recipient? What has to happen? How does it, how does it get inserted into the recipient's chromosome? What's that process called? Homologous recombination, right? And if that happens, now the recipient is a recombinant. The recipient is carrying donor DNA as well as its own DNA, right? And then that just gets passed down from generation after generation. So again, folks, you're like, well, who cares? Well, again, this is a way for antibiotic resistance genes to be transferred. Really important, you guys, we're going to see a lot. This is how toxin genes are transferred, um, even between species of bacteria. Don't even have to be related, right? You can transfer a toxin gene to a, um, a, um, a new bacterium. 
So this is a really important way that virulence factors, antibiotic resistance genes, can be transferred. Okay? So you guys, in transduction, is the donor alive? No. Nope, donor's dead, right? It was only in conjugation where the donor was alive. And you guys, I forgot to mention up here in transformation, we kind of we kind of gave a brief description of conjugation and transduction. I really didn't give like a definition of transformation. So in transformation, we have uptake of naked donor DNA by a competent, and we'll come back and tell you what we mean by competent, bacterial recipient. So you guys, a competent bacterial recipient, in nature, it would be one of the bacteria that can make those DNA binding proteins, right? So for a bacterium to be transformed with naked DNA, they either have to have those DNA binding proteins or we have to force them to become competent in the lab. We can do it artificially in the lab, okay? Okay, so folks, I think with that, what I'd like to do here, um, we still have a few more topics to hit, you guys, but I think um, what I prefer to do is let's save the last few slides for after lecture exam two. The last few slides, you guys, it's just a couple of applications of like um, what kind of genes can be transferred, why, do we, why are we worried about horizontal gene transfer. So you guys, let's, let's um, leave those last few topics till next Thursday after lecture exam two. Because what I'd like to do is still just harass you by some quiz questions, if you're okay with that. Some lecture exam two quiz questions. Are you guys all right with that? Okay, okay. Because again, you guys, I know, but I, I'm, I'm most worried about you for metabolism because it was so much information and it seems now it was so long ago. So that's what I kind of like to keep bugging you about is metabolism topics, okay? All right, so folks, let's, um, and, and just, just as a heads up, you guys, probably um, some of this that we'll be talking about today, I'll probably repeat it in the open lab. So just to give you the heads up. So again, folks, this is just a little bit, it, it's not exhaustive, right? Just a little bit of kind of practice quiz questions for lecture exam two. And we're talking about metabolism. Okay, so last time you guys, I think we had gone over, we had talked about reversible and irreversible enzyme inhibitors, right? We had talked about competitive inhibitors and allosteric inhibitors, right? And so we were starting down the road of looking at some antibiotics, right, to see, um, kind of using antibiotics as a way to, as some practical application of enzyme inhibitors. So you guys, we had started out asking you, what is an irreversible competitive inhibitor of bacterial transpeptidase? And you had told me what? The beta-lactams, right? And what was the first beta-lactam that was discovered? Penicillin. penicillin, good. And penicillin, we said, is relatively narrow, narrow spectrum because it usually can't pass through the outer membrane porins of most gram negatives, right? So usually it's used primarily for gram positives. Um, what are some extended spectrum or broader spectrum beta-lactams? Good, amoxicillin, good, you guys, amoxicillin. And ampicillin, good job, you guys, excellent, good, okay. But as Sir Alexander Flint Fleming warned us, if we if we overuse penicillin, we are going to select for bacteria which make which enzyme. Good, bacterial beta lactamases. And what do bacterial beta lactamases do? Yeah, they're going to destroy our penicillin, our amp and our amoxicillin, right? Okay, so folks, remember how the humans were like, okay, you know, all right, you know, 
you challenged us, and we're now we're going to step to the plate here and see what we can do. So you guys, can you remember an irreversible competitive inhibitor of bacterial beta-lactamines? I mean, just the names of these, you're like, oh my gosh. Can you think of an irreversible competitive inhibitor of bacterial beta-lactamase? So the, the target enzyme, you guys, is a bacterial beta-lactamase. We want something that's going to bind the active site and block, like, penicillin, ampicillin, or amoxicillin from getting in there. We want to protect the penicillin, amoxicillin, and ampicillin. Do you remember what this was? You get? And they discovered it in a bacterium. It was so cool. Oh, you got it. You got it. You guys remember the flavulonic uh, acid? Remember that? Is it? Oh, my God. The world is amazing. It's made by a soil bacterium. It binds to bacterial beta-lactamase and shuts it down, right? So you guys, do you remember um, the, one of the strategies they used? They would, they would take the clavulonic acid and mix it with, and I can never remember. I think it's amoxicillin. I can't remember, you guys. So clavulonic acid with amoxicillin. And um, one of the first combos was called Augmentin. So you could give this to your patient, and even if the patient had a beta-lactamase producing bacterial um, pathogen, the clavulonic acid would, would shut down, inhibit the bacterial beta-lactamase, protecting the amoxicillin, so then the amoxicillin could hopefully kill the pathogen. Wasn't that brilliant? I thought that was so cool. And then, you guys, another group of folks said, well, what if we could take our penicillin and chemically alter it so it can no longer fit in the active site of the beta-lactamase? Do you remember what we called those beta-lactams? What a mouthful. Do we call them the beta-lactamase-resistant beta-lactams? What a mouthful. Because they won't be destroyed by beta-lactamases. Do you remember probably the most famous one, you guys? Yeah, awesome. Awesome, you guys. Methicillin. I think, I think oxicillin is also. Okay, good. But what happened? Like the bacteria are like, all right, we'll show you. What evolved? Evolution of who evolved, you guys? The bacteria. Yeah, MRSA, right? What does MRSA stand for? Methicillin. Yeah, you got it. Resistant. Staph aureus. And what the heck is going on here? How could, you know, we said Staph aureus was the first to evolve the beta-lactamase, right? So here we've got a bit, excuse me, a beta-lactamase resistant beta-lactam. How can Staph aureus resist it? Do you remember what happened? A mutation in where? So this little guy has what? Has a, what's the target of beta-lactams? The, trans, the transpeptidase, right? So MRSA have a mutant bacterial, which enzyme do you guys help me out? Transpeptidase, right? To which none of the beta-lactams can bind. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing, you guys? I mean, it's not good for us humans, but it's pretty doggone amazing, right? This constant biological evolution going on out there. Isn't it amazing? Crazy. Okay, that's a big story, isn't it? That's a big story. Okay. Um, and you guys, because you know I love drugs, I love antibiotics, let's just keep going, okay? Let's, let's just make sure that you nail those antibiotics, all right? So you guys, can I erase this? Okay, so now we're, I'm kind of leaving um, metabolism, you guys, and I will come back because I really want to make sure that you have those antibiotics down, okay? And, and if not today, then in the open lab, I'll try to give a really quick overview of like glycolysis fermentation, aerobic, anaerobic respiration, and oxygenic and anoxygenic photosynthesis. 
Okay, so now you guys, we're just gonna we're gonna do this really broadly. Um, so antibiotics. All right. So you guys, um, can you name an inhibitor or an antibiotic that targets a bacterial gyrase? So we'll put. I know you guys. Let's do target and then antibiotic. Result. Okay, so you guys, can you help me out? Can you name um, antibiotics that will target and inhibit bacterial gyrases? Oh, yeah, yeah, good job, good job, you guys. So the fluoroquinolones, this is like the kind of the class, and the famous example, you guys, is what? Cipro, good. Ciprofloxacin used to treat folks with inhalation anthrax. But you guys, I, when I say result, it's like, why does that antibiotic inhibitor kill the bacteria? So what stops if we stop bacterial gyrase? No relaxation of DNA supercoils, right? Right. So the, the chromosomal DNA remains supercoiled, so you can't, um, you can't separate the strands for DNA replication or for transcription. Does that make sense, folks? And then, what about, kind of, it's still at kind of the genetics level here, you guys. What is an antibiotic that will knock out bacterial RNA polymerase? And, and you guys, this is one that has great penetrating capacity. It can get inside abscesses. It can get inside macrophages. It'll turn your patient's urine and feces and saliva and tears and sweat orange. Good, rifampin or rifamycin, right? One of the front 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 the front line drugs to treat Mycobacterium tuberculosis, right? Because it can get inside the macrophages where the Mycobacterium is growing. Okay, so again, you guys, so what? What if we inhibit bacterial RNA polymerase? What's the result? What's not going to happen? Good, no transcription. Right? So if there's no transcription, there's no mRNA. So you guys, indirectly, what will shut down? If there's no mRNA, can you make proteins? No. Yeah, so no proteins. No protein synthesis. That is awesome, you guys. Oh, speaking of protein synthesis, what about 70S ribosome inhibitors? Can you name like maybe four classes of antibiotics, you guys, that'll bind to 70S ribosomes or bacterial ribosomes? Oh, awesome. Tetracycline. Macrolides, good. Can, just for fun, you guys, can you give me a macrolide? Good. Erythromycin, awesome. Can you think of a class of antibiotics that are really hard on your patient's kidneys and can also potentially cause auditory nerve damage? So you gotta be careful with them. Immunoglycosides. Any, can you, can you, and I, I won't ask this on the exam, you guys, but just so we can practice for the real world, can you name an immunoglycoside? How about genomycin, canomycin? Streptomycin. Streptomycin is also used in um, TV sometimes. Look at that. And then the last class we probably don't want to use because it can cause aplastic anemia in some patients is chlorothenicol. Okay, guys, so what happens if you have a bacterial infection and you give your patient one of these antibiotics, they target the 70 ribosome, what will be the consequence? No bacterial. What, what's the function of ribosomes? Yeah, protein synthesis. What's a fancy term for protein synthesis? Translation, good. Awesome, you guys. Good job. Okay. Um, let me see here. What about, what about um, um, enzymes? Bacterial enzymes, enzymes involved in 
folic acid synthesis. And folic acid is required as a coenzyme for DNA and RNA synthesis. So you guys remember those, it, it was, um, we described them as sequential inhibitors of the enzymes involved in folic acid synthesis. Sulfur. Good, the sulfa drugs. And one specific example, sulfa methoxazole, sulfa methoxazole. Azole. And what was the partner that knocks out another enzyme? Trimethoprim, awesome. And this combination, you guys, like in combo, one one of the um, names for the combination is Bactrim. But it was really it was really good, you guys. Um, Nina Howard, who's in the Monday Wednesday section. She said, you have to be careful like in pregnant women. It's fascinating, yeah. So you have to be careful with these folic acid inhibitors. And I'm like, well, that's fascinating because folic acid is a vitamin for us. Like, we have to consume it. But guess what? Your bacteria in your intestine are making folic acid. And so they're actually supplying us with folic acid. That's one of the benefits, right, of our intestinal microbes. They're making vitamins for us. So it makes sense, you guys, if you shut down folic acid synthesis in your bacteria, and maybe your diet, um, you don't have enough folic acid in your diet, right? Then that could potentially cause a folic acid deficiency in you. And it's a big issue, you guys. And A&P, help me out here. Isn't folic acid really important in pregnant women to prevent, is it spina bifida in the baby? Do you guys know the mechanism? Okay, I shouldn't go into that now. But it's like, I would love to know more about that. But be careful with folic acid inhibitors. Folic acid synthesis inhibitors in your pregnant patients. I think that's fascinating, you guys learning this stuff. Should I stop? You're so tired, I know. You guys, you're just like, you're just super, so tired. Um, maybe I'm just like brain dead myself. Let's see here. So what's the result of the sulfur drug? So, the, so to the bacteria? Mm -hmm. They make their own folic acid, so they, many of them don't have transport proteins. Because you say, well, if they're living in a human, and the human is consuming folic acid in vitamin form or from, or from the diet, why don't the bacteria just transport folic acid into the cells? Well, my understanding is a lot of them never evolve transport proteins to do it, because they're like, we make it ourselves. But... Resistance can be overcome if the bacteria evolve a way to transport folic acid from their human host into the cell. That's one way they can overcome the resistance to this. Oh, I know, I, I know what you're asking. What's the result, right? So you guys, so um, folic acid is required in DNA and RNA synthesis. So we, we could say we're gonna indirectly, sorry, Matthew, you're like, just finish the cartoon over here. <laughs> indirectly inhibit bacterial what? DNA and RNA synthesis, right? So we can't replicate the chromosome, so they can't divide. If they can't make RNA, if there's no transcription, there'll be no translation, no protein synthesis. Does that make sense? And thanks, you guys. I'm like a little puppy. I'm like, oh, look, there's a butterfly. <laughs> okay, should, you guys, how about, how about we stop there? Unless there's questions. You guys have questions? Yeah, yeah, Brianna. They're going to be week five through nine. Okay. Weeks five through nine, the MOWs, the microbes of the weeks, you guys, those are all bonus, right? Don't stress. They're just bonus. Just guess. If you don't study them, just they're multiple choice. Just guess. You might get a lot of them right. But it would be weeks five through nine. Okay? All right, you guys, take good care. I'll see half of you at the 1 o'clock lab, and the rest of you, if I don't see an open lab, take good care. Try to get some rest this weekend, okay? <laughs>
So you did say that the bows were going to be included on this exam as well, weeks five all, Yeah, eight. always. Okay. Um, weeks five through nine. Now, okay. five, yeah, five Thank through you. nine. You are 